we are very delighted this year to be hosting Christina Huff Summers, who is uh, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining this, uh, this institute, she was a professor of philosophy at Clark University, where she specialized in moral theory. Her articles have appeared in publications such as the Journal of Philosophy, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, New Republic, Slate, the Daily Beast, and the Atlantic. She's also the editor of Vice and Virtue in Everyday Life, a leading college ethics textbook, and the author of Who Stole Feminism and The War Against Boys, the latter was a New York Times notable book of the year in 2000. She's co-author of One Nation Under Therapy, a tremendous book. And by the way, in this book, we, uh, I was surprised, as I was reading this book, I discovered that she, is, she made a reference to our own president, James Herbert, and he was considered, the, he was one of 19 internet rebels who opposed a, a certain kind of therapism that is widely practiced in the United States. And her book, Freedom Feminism, was published in June 2013, and a revised and new edition of The War Against Boys came out in August 2013. She has lectured and taken part in debates on hundreds of college campuses. She hosts a weekly video blog, The Factual Feminist, which I highly recommend, which has attracted more than 4 million views. So please help me welcome Christina Summers to the podium. Well, thank you very much, Anwar, for that gracious introduction. And thanks to all of you coming out on this lovely evening to see me coming from rainy Washington, DC. Uh, I'm happy to be in New England. I have spent many years of my life in Boston. Any Red Sox fans? <laughs> Any? What about, oh, they're gone. <laughs> well, they're not, I won't, I won't ask that. I thought I couldn't quite compete with that, that guy in the yellow shirt. <laughs> well, um, for most of my academic career, I have devoted myself to studying the history of feminism and women's quest for freedom. So in the next 40 minutes, which I'm gonna lose track of, so I'll keep, uh, I'll keep track on my watch. Okay, the next 40 minutes, I'm going to try to give you the best information I can on this topic. But of course, um, information is never the whole story. I have a point of view, and I will tell you about that as well. I think I'm going to need my glasses. Let's see here. Oh, no, wrong ones. <laughs> they actually help with that light. I wonder if I could do that. No, it'd be too weird. Um, If pollsters ask, do you consider yourself a feminist? Most Americans say no. Uh, there was a 2016 u.gov poll, entirely typical, about 26% said yes, and the rest either said no, don't know, definitely not. Um, in a recent British survey, this was just uh, in last year, 8% agreed that they were feminists and the rest for whatever reason, rejected the designation. However, this is what's interesting. If you ask people, do you believe in gender equality, nearly everyone says yes. Now, some uh, feminists are naturally frustrated by this. If people believe in equality, why don't they just call themselves feminists? Well, pollsters have asked this question. And the number one answer people give is that feminism is too extreme. Now, there are many styles of feminism, and they aren't all extreme, but I think there is merit to this uh, explanation, and I'm going to argue that overall, the charge of extremism, you know, it has, there, there's some basis in, in reality. So in the time I have with you uh, tonight, I'm going to explain what I think has gone wrong with feminism and how to set it right. Now, some of you may be thinking, feminism is just fine the way it is. Thank you very much. We don't need your suggestions on how to improve it. And others may be wondering, like, why would you want to, you know, try to improve something that is so outmoded and, and annoying? It's like trying to improve rotary phones. Just let it go. 
Now, to the student, where are the students sitting over there? Do you know what rotary phones are? <laughs> I have to find another metaphor, but anyway. I'm not going to let feminism go. The liberation of women is one of the glories of Western civilization. Women organized, fought for, and won equality before the law. Feminism is one of the great chapters in the history of freedom. And yes, I agree with my sister feminists. The struggle is incomplete. There is still work to be done. Women, far more than men, are struggling with the challenge of combining work and family. Violence against women is diminishing, but it continues to exact a, a terrible toll. And then there are the Harvey Weinsteins in our midst. Furthermore, for many women outside the West, the quest for equality has hardly begun. There are places in the world where women have not had the benefits of two major waves of feminism, let alone two waves. They haven't had as much as a trickle. And I often attend international women's conferences, and I will meet, it's very exciting to meet women from Somalia or Egypt or Cambodia, who are sort of the Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Sojourner Truth of their country. And they're fighting battles that we fought and won uh, you know, a long time ago, but feminism, is, is, we need it, the world needs it, and the, when I meet these, it, at these international conferences, these uh, feminist leaders from across the world, they are asking for our attention, for our help, and um, so when someone says, who needs feminism, my answer is, we do, the world does, but to be effective, it's going to have to change. So I'm gonna suggest three reforms that I would like you to consider. Uh, the changes I'm going to suggest will not, I mean, I think they could not make the women's movement merely more effective. I do think it would, they would make it more effective. I think these changes could make it awesome. I mean, just powerful, unstoppable, and an unstoppable force for good. Now, that may sound a bit grandiose, but I have some historical examples to back me up. Hmm. Reform number one, get the facts straight. Sound policies on real problems, if you take something like workplace equity or discrimination or sexual harassment or violence against women, sound policies must be predicated on solid research. And legislators, educators, the public, they need trustworthy information on the status of women. They get too little of that. Um, in, the, in the spring of 2014, I launched uh, a video series, as you heard, The Factual Feminist. And in every episode, I try to offer viewers the best, most up-to-date information on a pressing gender issue. Now, when I started the series, uh, I told my mother that I was doing this, and I'm not doing it every week now, but at the time I was doing it every week, and my mother said, aren't you gonna run out of topics? How, can there be so much confusion and mistakes? And I said, I can go on forever, because we've, what we have is, it's nobody intended it this way, but for complicated reasons, we have a body of research produced by scholars, some of it's accurate and some of it's not, but if you're outside that world and you criticize it, you're not always taken seriously or you're thought to be trying to take women back, you're part of a backlash. And my, so I became known as someone who was sort of hypercritical and constantly reviewing people's studies and people thought, well, that's anti-feminist. I don't see it that way. I am committed to the idea that Truth is on the, that, that truth is on the side of compassion. Truth is on the side of intelligent reform. And over the years, I, it's not only me, I and other critics have looked at standard claims about women and violence, depression, eating disorders, pay equity, education. And what we found is, uh, as I said, just this mix of exciting, important research and findings, and then misleading false bogus information. And I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. And um, it's, um, it takes something like the wage gap. It's 
how many times have we heard that, you know, for the same work, women earn 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. And that's um, irritating to most women and anyone that hears it and cares about social justice. Uh, young women taking an introductory women's studies class and they, they read about the wage gap and it becomes, uh, you know, just part of a, you know, a set of um, truths about the world that, that suggest that it's rigged against women. But just think about it for a second. If, you, if an employer could pay a woman 23 cents, you know, less than he or she pays a man by hiring women, wouldn't they just fire the men and hire women? Um, that should close, you know, they would, have, they would have a huge advantage over competitors. Now, that doesn't tend to happen because the gap, it, I'm not denying there is a gap, but the gap doesn't appear to be, the best explanation doesn't appear to be discrimination. It, it ignores factors that explain or justify different pay because that, that 23 cent gap is just, you take all the men and women in the country working full time and you just do the average and that's the difference. But we need to know more. We need to know well, what, what type of job did they have and what was their education and how many hours did they work per week and what was their college major. And when these relevant factors are taken into account, the gender wage gap narrows to the point of vanishing. And wage gap activists will reject this analysis and they will say, no, no, no. Even women with identical educations who study the same thing, you know, and go into the same field, they still earn less than men. And uh, when I read about that, I think, okay, let's look at that. And then what I find, the AAUW, the American Association of University Women did such a study, I look at it and they just, you could, they failed to control for critical variables. And if you look at the variables, as I said, the gap just isn't there. There may be, it depends on the study. There, many studies show that there's five or six cents that can't be accounted for. And even there, we don't know if it's because of discrimination or some other factor that, that determines wages. Now, that's a, what usually happens if I'm in a debate about this is that um, the, person, the, way, the person who believes in the wage gap will tell me um, that, okay, they might, they'll probably have to agree because even feminist economists agree that it's not because employers are deliberately cheating women out of 23 cents. The reason that there's a gap is because um, they will say in our society, women are initiated into particular gender roles. They're driven by powerful sexist stereotypes. So on this view, for example, <laughs> if you look at college majors, the most lucrative major, I think the last time I looked was like petroleum engineering. And the least, some of the least might be early childhood education. Now there is a gender gap in those who go out for petroleum engineering and those who go for early childhood education. You will earn less. So the question is, um, is the person, the young woman, let's say, who's majoring in early childhood education, is, has she been duped or is there something in the environment? I mean, maybe, but we've been trying for 30 years more, 40 years to change ma college majors and we have succeeded up to a point, but only up to a point, there's still a very large gap in terms of, of college majors. And even when men and women go into the same field, they don't behave exactly the same way. So for example, engineering, we said petroleum engineering or I don't know, aerospace engineering, you make the highest amount. And if you go into biomedical engineering, um, you, environmental engineering, you make less. Well, women are overrepresented among the, in biomedical and, and environmental, and l l much less likely to go into these other specialties. You have to factor that in. But now they're saying, well, no, the reason women are going into the biomedical and not the petroleum is, is social conditioning. So if that's the case, uh, 
<clears throat> the point is that our, our choices are not really free. They're driven by sexist stereotypes. So in this view, you know, our proclivities and our choices is, is evidence of social coercion. Now, now, I get that. I can see that how that could happen. I certainly would agree that explained a lot about the United States 50 years ago, but it's 2018, and American women are among the best informed and most self-determined human beings in the world. And to say that we are manipulated or coerced into our life choices by forces beyond our control, I mean, in a certain sense, that could be true, but then that would be true of all of us. It becomes this metaphysical problem about free will, and we're not going to resolve that very soon, I can tell you. Uh, or, or it seems to me that we're not crediting young women with agency. Uh, it's almost as if it's, well, I'm kind of matronizing. Anyway, I don't pretend to have the last word in the debate over the wage gap, and uh, it, it's possible I'm missing something. We all suffer from something called confirmation bias. We tend to be very open and receptive to evidence that supports what we already believe, and we're closed and suspicious of counter evidence. And I sometimes see this in myself, and I try very hard to correct it. I may not always succeed, but every time a new study comes out declaring that women are being cheated out of this, I, I, I'm, I try to be open-minded and think, okay, I'll factor this in. I, I'll use it in my lecture as an example of how women are still held back, held back. But most of the time, I'll look at it and then see the same old mistakes, failure to factor relevant variables, and, and uh, I find flaws. And in some ways, I wish I didn't. And I could just go along and, and agree because it would be easier. You, 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 if you question many of these statistics, people are very, very unhappy with you. Um, and no reasonable people, no reasonable person will deny that women face economic challenges and hardship. Uh, and there are certainly pockets out there where there's prejudice uh, against women and employers who discriminate. What I'm saying is that evidence of systemic discrimination in the workplace is just not there. <clears throat> now, this claim about discrimination and you know women earning only 77 cents or whatever they say, 80 cents sometimes on the dollar for a man earn, that a man earns for the same work, it's been repeated so often it's almost beyond rational analysis, and it's taken on an aura of truth, and it's become just part of a case uh, against, uh, that one can make against uh, the injustice in American society. And so people seem to be very unwilling to give it up. But faulty hypotheses and misleading statistics, they don't solve problems. In fact, they get in the way of solutions. And I urge all of you who care about the wage gap politics, and I, I can understand if you don't, but if you do, have a look at uh, a recent work by the Harvard economist Claudia Golden. A brilliant woman. She's done a lot of research, groundbreaking research, greatly respected by feminists of all stripes. And uh, she sees little or no evidence of wage discrimination by employers. Um, so she's just moved beyond it, beyond it. And her mind is now open to new ideas and new ways of thinking to strengthen women economically. And she's full of intriguing suge suggestions. And if you don't have time to read her technical papers, you could just Google NPR uh, Freakonomics Claudia Golden. And there she is being interviewed. And um, she's tentative. She's not sure that it'll think she's suggesting a work or if it's an intractable problem. Maybe it's just a human problem we're going to have a hard time solving. But, but we've spent three decades misdescribing the problem and, and, and not accepting what Claudia Golden and others who study it seriously will say. 
So that's what I mean when I say I think these, uh, the reason that I dwell on this is that it, it doesn't help women. But it does create rancor, and I'll talk about the rancor in a minute. Uh, let's, let's look at another statistic. We often hear um, that uh, one in four women will be victims of rape or sexual assault on campus. Rape is a horrible crime, no matter what the numbers. And if you t to talk about the data is it, just even talking about the numbers, it, it's, for some people it will be, it'll sound insensitive. I think if we don't talk about the numbers and we don't get the data right, we're not gonna solve the problem. We're not going to come up with, with reasonable policies to, we may never solve the problem, but I'm sure, I'm certain that there are smart ways to, to protect women and men, men are also victims, but there are smart ways to protect human beings from sex, sexual predators. Now, but if you look at the fact, if you look at the statistic, there's just no evidence of an epidemic of rape on the college campus. We have stringent laws against rape in this country. Rapists are rightly uh, despised, but in, but in fact, the latest data from the FBI and the, and the US, uh, the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics shows that all violent crime has fallen dramatically in the United States. No one knows exactly why. Uh, but in murder and, and rape have fallen dramatically. And uh, it appears to be that this is the case on the campus. There are do dozens of studies claiming to show epidemic. And as I said, we hear one in four, one in five. Uh, but the studies behind those claims tend to be agenda-driven and um, unscientific. I and others have looked closely at their methodology and we immediately see that they're very, very typical flaws. I will, ex I will demonstrate these flaws by asking all of you a question. Uh, how many of you, when you were a kid, were ever uh, kicked or hit or you know, pushed by a brother or sister? Oh, that's more than I expected. All right, how many of you ever kicked or hit or... Oh, <laughs> uh, be honest here. <laughs> now, if I wanted to do, I don't know, for whatever reason, I wanted to do advocacy research and I had an agenda, I could report that, you know, epidemic of family violence in the backgrounds of students. And, and, and I, what I could... Or, or, you know, whatever I wanted to do. I could make, I could make you look like, uh, I, I could create a crisis and then project it onto the entire country. Uh, so what you do is you use vaguely worded questions and you pose them to a non-representative sample of people. Uh, now, we've got one organization, uh, it's not, it's the Bureau of Justice Statistics at the United States Department, uh, of the, the, the Justice Department. The Bureau does, it sets the gold standard for research, for crime research, and it has studied campus sexual assault and found vastly lower numbers, not one in four or five, but something like one in 53. Now, that is still too many, but apparently it's not, it's, it's not enough for some of the activists. Finding the truth about sexual assault is a challenge, and the statisticians at the Bureau of Justice Statistics will tell you that. It is a challenge. And it, it depends on a, there's so many ways to go wrong and so few ways to go right. And I'm not even sure, I mean, I, what I do know is the Bureau of Justice Statistics, they don't have an agenda. They, they wanna use the best research they can and get to the truth. Uh, whereas not, not all, but many of the other studies that show epidemics seem to me to be agenda driven. And again, in my, my factual feminist series, what I try to find is that let's, let's get to the truth about what's going on and then use precious resources to help victims. But if we are, if it's epidemic, it's happening everywhere, and the number never changes. We've, it's been one in four 
for 30 years, I think. It never changes, nothing. So you can't even find out if what you're doing is working because the numbers just don't change. Um, and then th this is what happened. So we've been, we've, we've heard it. women are cheated out of, um, you know, 23 percent of their salary, and one in four women are raped. And, and a recent survey from Thomson Reuters uh, came out. I saw the headline, and it said that, uh, according to their survey, the U.S. was one of the 10 most dangerous countries in the world for women. And the U.S. came out more dangerous than Iran, Venezuela, North Korea. <laughs> Uh, and we came in number three for sexual violence, sandwiched in between the Congo and Syria. And uh, I just, you know, I saw this, and, and it was going all over Twitter, and CNN had a story, and CBS News, Newsweek, they were all saying, U.S. on the, you know, 10 worst, 10 most dangerous countries in the world for women. And I just thought, what, what on earth did they do? Like, what questions, how did this happen? And I've done a factual feminist. It was the last one that I did. But I, I um, one thing that struck me is none of the reporters, not one, and this includes the people I met, you know, the reporters at CBS and Fortune, Newsweek, USA Today, uh, not one of them thought to question Reuters about its methodology. And none of them bothered to mention that the finding is ludicrous. I mean, the United States is far from perfect, but it is not among the world's most dangerous countries for women, not even close. Women across the globe are plagued with things like, there are parts of the world where they're plagued by acid attacks and child marriage and forced veiling, stonings, female infanticide and female genital mutilation. Such practices are rare to non-existent in the United States. But if you ask Thompson Reuters for information about its methodology, you get back a form letter explaining that, quote, the poll is based on perceptions, not data. Well, whose perceptions? They won't say. We gave an assurance to the experts that their answers would be confidential. And, uh, we, uh, and that, they said, allowed for total honesty. So all you can find is they had a, a several, I don't know, 500 or so experts whom we have no idea who they are, and apparently, if they didn't have confidentiality, the implication is they might not be totally honest. I don't know what that means, but anyway. Um, and the foundation, it, they rolled out this survey as if it were serious social science, and they talked about representative samples and response rates and weighted scores, and most American reporters were taken in. Now, Reuters, is one of the most esteemed and venerable names in journalism. But this survey is a, tra is a travesty, and it lacks transparency and credibility. It conveys information. It encourages cynicism about journalism. It fuels charges of fake news. And as for, oh, by the way, one thing about the survey, they made a big mistake because for what, with their strange methodology, India came out as the number one most dangerous country in the world for women. And this did not go over well in India. And so there was a huge pushback, and the, the, the uh, head of the Thomas Reuters Foundation had to go on Indian TV and, and, and defend the study, and that was not easy uh, because the Indians were calling it statistical gibberish, statistical gibberish. And <laughs> she was saying, oh, no, no, it's a snapshot of a situation in time, and it was a snapshot of Reuters, Thomson Reuters Foundation losing its credibility, and American reporters going along for the ride. I mean, Indian reporters were, did a good job, and American reporters just, if it was a victim statistic, it had to be true, I don't know. Um, now, then this is a good moment to pause and point out that there are, these things go, go on on the political left and the political right. Uh, in both camps, you will have people, occasionally even presidents, uh, inventing statistics in order to legitimize uh, their agenda. Um, I just warn you to consider the source on, from both sides. Uh, there is a lot of credible research out there from hardworking people, but there is a lot of agenda-driven advocacy research. I don't know why. Thomson Reuters is doing it, but 
anyway, I think we all have an obligation to, um, to fight even those on our side uh, who use misleading data and push an agenda. And I, I highly recommend a book by a, a Dr. Alice Dregler called Galileo's Middle Finger. Um, it's called Her Heretics, Activists, and One Scholar's Search for Justice. And she's just a very quirky, brilliant uh, scholar. And, and she ran into trouble in various ways. And you don't want to mess with Alice. She never, she will not do whatever is the politically correct thing for the right or the left. She's out to find the truth. And she, and she says in her book something I found just very powerful. She said, if you want justice, support the search for truth. And she says, if you really want meaningful progress and not just temporary self-righteousness, go for the truth. And she said, to pursue a principle effectively, you have to know if your route will lead to your destination. So we have to get our facts straight. That's the first thing. Um, now, moving on, my second reform. So we're going to have a very powerful feminism because it's going to be evidence-based. It's going to present women, the media, Congress, Thomson Reuters, with serious, high-powered uh, scholarship and not agenda-driven uh, propaganda. That's, so that's number one. Number two, it's time to start uh, treating men as allies and not adversaries. There's just too much demonization of the male sex and even talk of toxic masculinity and male privilege. Uh, Susanna Denuta Walters is a professor of sociology and director of the Women's and Gender Sexuality Studies at, at Northeastern University. And she's also the editor of one of the most uh, prominent uh, gender studies journals, Signs. In a recent Washington Post op-ed entitled, Why Can't We Hate Men? She argues we can <laughs> and should. And she mentions the wage gap, per pervasive wage injustice, and male violence. She inveighs against a legislative legitimized, le but I can't even say this, legislatively legitimized toxic masculinity. And her op-ed ends with these uplifting words, we have every right to hate you. You have done us wrong. Uh, you know, it just seems to me so obvious that it's wrong to hate an entire group of people for behavior by a subset of its members. That's the classic move of, uh, that we identify as bigotry. It's the logic of bigotry. Um, it's gaining currency. And not just among feminists. I mean, in, in people that want to, people that, I mean, her piece was why, you know, why can't we hate men? She seems to want to hate. Um, now, uh, in a minute, I'm going to quote a men's right activist who's very much her match in anger and hatred. But I'll, uh, men, uh, I'll get to him in a minute. Men, uh, now, she might respond, and, and she, there was a lot of pushback. And uh, she, her response was, but look, you know, it's men, primarily, who wreak all the havoc in the world. And, you can point to murderers and rapists and child molesters and terrorists, and it is disproportionately men. So people, you know, we have hashtags, yes, all men. No, not yes, all men. Uh, most men are not murderers, rapists, child molesters, terrorists, uh, a small minority. Uh, and sociologists make an important distinction between pathological masculinity and healthy masculinity. And males who exhibit a deviant pathological masculinity, they define their manhood through antisocial destructive acts. And instead of protecting uh, those who are vulnerable, they exploit them. And instead of building, they destroy. Healthy masculinity is the opposite. <laughs> Health, men who evince healthy masculinity, uh, which is, I think, the best evidence we have, uh, a majority. Um, they strive to be helpful, they strive to achieve, and they sublimate their natural aggression into constructive pursuits. They build, they don't destroy. And, um, and you know, their, their urge isn't to bully and, and 
harm someone who's physically weaker than them, but to protect them. So if someone says, well, some men are evil, therefore all men are evil, it's an obvious logical and moral fallacy. The answer to male chauvinism is not female chauvinism. The answer is equality and mutual regard, respect. Men aren't our adversaries. They are our brothers, sons, husbands, friends. And gender resentment is, is divisive. It's not, again, it's not solving problems. It's not making us free. And it's driving some of us crazy. Neither sex has the monopoly on good or evil. Both are, I mean, men are capable of more physical violence, but women can excel at emotional violence. Uh, both are capable of cruelty, destruction, and great goodness as well. Neither has a lock on vice or virtue. And Margaret Atwood, who's the author of The Handmaid's Tale, recently said, my fundamental position is that women are human beings with the full range of saintly and demonic behaviors this entails. So I, I think uh, my point here is that it's time to dispense with the women are from Venus, men are from hell rhetoric. And um, where is my, oh, I'll get to my male, men's right activist in a minute. We often, uh, oh, okay, so, so toxic masculinity, I, I think it's, uh, when it's applied to majority of men, I think it's prejudicial. I think it's a, it's a kind of uh, bigotry and not helpful. Make men your ally and not your adversary. And the other term I'd like to interrogate is male privilege. We often hear that men in our society carry around with them an invisible knapsack of advantage. That's actually true. But here's what's left out. Women have some pretty good visible advantages of their own. Um, now, if you're willing to cherry pick, stretch the truth a bit, suppress counter evidence, you can make our society look terrible for women. Not as terrible as Thompson Reuters, like worse than, I don't know, you know Congo or Syria. But um, you can make it look really bad. I don't know why people want to do that, but they do, so okay. But if you want to make it look bad, you know, you point to the wage gap and blame it on discrimination and you, you, you declare an epidemic of violence and you focus on women's vulnerability to sexual objectification and body shaming and you point to mansplaining and manspreading and uh, bad things men do. And before long, you will construct a full-scale patriarchy. But here's the problem. Men have a lot of disadvantages, too, um, and women have advantages. So take education. Um, now, there is a domain where women are the privileged sex at every level edu of education, across all you know, ethnic and racial class lines. Women tend to be the stronger students. They get better grades. They win the majority of honors and the prizes, uh, they are far more likely to go to college. Today, women earn a majority of bachelor's, master's, and even doctorate degrees. Our schools are doing a better job educating girls than boys. That's just, that's big, that's huge. Uh, there is a, a, a growing cohort of young men, but little boys, and who will become young men who are going to find no place for themselves in, an, in a knowledge-based economy. Now, according to the Labor Department, right now, there are 10 million men in prime working years, 25 to 54, who are just out of the labor force. It, they're not unemployed because they're not looking for work. They're just missing in action. And the economist Larry Summers has looked at the at projections, and he's concluded that by mid-century, more than a third of all, unless things change, more than a third of all men in the US between 25 and 54 will be out of work. Now, women are, they're just better projections because women realize that the passport to as this academics, I heard at, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education at a seminar, they said that education beyond high school is the new passport to the American dream. And increasingly, 
Women are getting it and men are not. There was a time where you could get through high school, get out, work hard, make it into the middle class. Very hard to do that now. You need that education beyond, beyond high school. Advantage women. Now, a lot, uh, if you look at the uh, workplace, there's a lot of attention on uh, people at the height of, you know, at the pinnacle of achievement. So we, we look at how unfair it is. There's so many uh, CEOs in the Fortune 500 that are men or, I don't know, senators or, or full phys tenured physics professors at MIT, too few women. And I agree. We want to close those gaps as much as we can. But that's not the whole story. You have to look at the whole workplace. And the picture changes. Take something uh, which are known as the um, lethal professions, uh, jobs where is a very high risk of injury and death, uh, oil rig workers or tower climbers, roofers. Uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics reports that every year about 5,000 Americans die in the workplace, 92% men. So we hear all about the fortune 500 CEOs, but what about those unfortunate 4,600? Uh, so it, it, if you, and then you can look at uh, uh, the overall murder rate in our society. There's, I don't know, 12,000 murders in 2013. The last year that I looked, 78% men. And people will say, but yeah, but it's men committing the crime. It's a small percentage of men committing these crimes, and it's very often other men that stop them or try to protect us from them. That's the full picture. And I, I'm not going to go on, but if you were at a men's rights uh, uh, meeting, they could do exactly what Susanna Denuta uh, uh, Walters does, the professor. Uh, they could talk about male suicide. It's shockingly high compared to female suicide. Men, you know, in prison, and even when there's some data, a uh, University of Michigan study, that showed that even when men and women commit the same crime and with similar backgrounds, the men's uh, receive far longer sentences. And so if you wanted to, which I don't, because this is not my point. My point is not to say, no, women have the privilege and men, uh, and, and men are uh, the ones that are oppressed. But there is a guy, uh, Paul Elam, he leads one of the most popular men's rights groups, A Voice for Men. And uh, he's made some video, uh, unflattering video about me, calling me a stealth feminist. And you know, like, Paul, I'm not a stealth feminist. I'm, I call myself an equity feminist, the factual feminist. I'm not hiding it. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't watched the video. And I don't encourage you to watch it, but you might anyway. <laughs> uh, so he has described women as opportunistic parasites in the lives of men. This was in a speech before his group. Now, by the way, not all, just like not all feminists are like the, the professor that says we should hate men. Not all men's rights activists. There, there's the men's, you know, men's health network, and there are groups that are doing good work for boys. I'm talking about specifically this group of Voice for Men and Mr. Elam. And like Professor Danuta, he, he goes through a long, syst long list of injustices and how women exploit men financially, subject men to ruinous divorces, alienate them from their children. Uh, and then he refers to de destructive personality disordered women whose evil acts are enabled by society. So instead of hating women, uh, like he doesn't think we he doesn't think we should hate it, men should hate them but he says avoid them, <laughs> and he endorses a movement called mm, how do you say this it's called men going their own way MGTOW, and uh, what they suggest um, MGTOW, men going their own way is just stay away from women, You're, you you'll be ruined don't date. Uh, don't get married, for God's sake. Don't have kids. Consider celibacy. But if you really need sex, pay for an escort. <laughs> now, I think Susanna and Paul, 
they, it's, I, I read one or the other, it's like a divorcing you know, couple, and you hear what a monster the other is. And what I, when I hear this, and, and by the way, in quoting her, she is extreme, and even for a man, he's extreme, but this, this on the internet, and increasingly in the media, this very divisive, angry language is catching on. And in universities, uh, the, 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 I think it's sort of harsh rhetoric of Professor Walters is, it has, I don't, this is an overstatement, but I'm gonna say it anyway, it has tenure. I mean, that rhetoric is in the gender studies textbooks. It's very harsh and takes a very grim view of American society and our place in it and not celebrating what I believe in, equity feminism and the achievements of equity feminism. I think it was good for women and it was good for men too. Um, so anyway, uh, what I would tell Paul Elam and Professor Walters is that modern life is a complicated mix of burdens and benefits for each sex. And men and women have distinctive advantages and face distinctive challenges. And if men have to check their privilege, then so do women. And, but why play the game? And a wise person once observed that nobody is ever gonna win the battle of the sexes. There'll be too much fraternizing with the enemy. Now, <laughs> of course that's right. I mean, just imagine all of the defectors crossing enemy lines and hobnobbing and fraternizing and shacking up with enemy combatants. <laughs> so yes, it's a battle no one can win. But you know what? That doesn't mean both sides can't lose. Because a house divided by gender, not only won't it stand, it, when it collapses, it's going to damage our happiness and well-being. Men and women need each other. We rise and fall together. Uh, a gender war is a war against ourselves. So I'm checking my time here. Uh, OK. How, much, how many more minutes do I have? Nah. OK. I will. You'll regret saying that. Mm. OK, so we want to get our facts straight, and we're just, you know, show a little, some goodwill towards men and to the angry men, some goodwill towards women. <laughs> Third reform, make the movement more diverse. Now, in recent years, the women's movement has become more inclusive of women, in color, of, women of color, of other marginalized communities, they've done a good job being more open to women who were not typically represented in the mainstream women's studies texts, and that's all a good thing. But now, let's take the next step and make it intellectually and politically diverse. There, it, it, there has to be a place in any healthy women's movement for liberal women, conservative women, libertarian women, not only very radical women. Uh, and they can differ on a lot of issues. They don't have to agree because they can, they can converge on important uh, uh, goals for improving the lives of women. Uh, and I'm going to give you just some quick examples historically. Uh, if you look at when women made the great, the huge progress, you go to the 18th century, you start with uh, someone like Mary Wollstonecraft, who led one of the most fascinating, adventurous lives of the 18th century. Uh, she was a rebel and a free thinker and believed that she had the temerity to believe that women had, were as intelligent as, as men and as worthy of respect. And uh, her seminal work, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, it was an instant sensation, and she wrote it in the spirit of the European Enlightenment, whose primary principle was the essential dignity and moral equality of all rational beings. And Mary Wollstonecraft pointed out, women too are rational and equally deserving of liberty and equality, dignity. And she said, uh, strengthen the female mind by enlarging it and there will be an end to blind obedience. Uh, she was one of the earliest and most passionate and most effective proponents for female education. But at the time she was writing, there was another woman named Hannah Moore. Uh, and this, these are 18th century, 
Hannah More was a novelist and a poet and a political activist and evangelical reformer and abolitionist. Uh, but she was waging a very different campaign. And these women did not like each other very much. Uh, Wollstonecraft was radical and Hannah More, very hard to classify, but I would say maybe the first conservative feminist. Like Wollstonecraft, she was uh, this self-made woman uh, and she became the intellectual peers of the leading men of her day. Uh, one biographer, uh, and by the way, there's some fantastic uh, women's studies scholars at UCLA, 18th century experts on women, and women's writers. And it, because of them, I was able to find all these things about Hannah More, and they're, they're wonderful. And, and, and when I criticize um, gender exaggerations, I'm not criticizing women's studies. I, I may have made that mistake a long time ago, but I think it, it, women's studies can encompass a lot of very, very solid and important scholarship. But it's it's more um, the the gender that what I oppose is sort of the gender exaggeration and the the gender war rhetoric that you get sometimes in in feminist theory. Anyway, she this this uh, Hannah Moore was more famous than. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, and her books outsold Jane Austen's. Um, and she's sometimes credited with saving England from having a, a brutal revolutionary upheaval that, that they had in France. And historians have referred to Hannah as Hannah Moore as a Christian capitalist. She liked the free market. That was different. Uh, she was a bourgeois progressivist uh, or the first Victorian. Uh, but as I said, I, I like to call her the first conservative feminist. Unlike Wollstonecraft, she believed that women and men were different and had different aptitudes and propensities and preferences, but she was a huge proponent of empowered femininity. She saw women as domestic heroines. And at the time she was writing, poor women were hardly educated at all, and wealthy women spent their time you know, hardly educated in their way, and just doing you know the, the trivial pursuits, you know, embroidery and and uh, just you know chattering away and not no serious conversation. And Hannah More and her co her colleagues, which was, these women were starving for serious. Con these were brilliant women, and uh, Hannah More told women of all classes that they were part of this mission. To, uh, to make the world more humane. And uh, she encouraged women to work in wealthy, aristocratic women. Get out of your, your salons and go home. Uh, go out into the world and exert yourself in hospitals, orphanages, schools. Uh, and she, she had this, she said to women, I want you to go out with a patriotism at once firm and feminine for the greatest good of all. And here's the strange thing, women listen to her. It, it, Mary Wollstonecraft was the better, the greater thinker and the greater writer for us. But at the time, it was Hannah More that women were, and then of course once women were out, out of the private sphere and in the public sphere, that they would begin to learn about society and, and want to get the vote. It was a radicalizing um, project. But what historians have said is you had these two movements working together. You had a kind of conservative feminism and a radical feminism. They didn't always get along, but, they, but on women's education, they were together and it changed the world. It happened again, and I'm gonna do this very quickly because I could go on and on about Frances Willard, but she was one of the most, I'm moving up now to the, to the suffrage era. She was one of the most beloved and respected women in 19th century America, and it was, uh, some credit her with bringing, making the suffrage movement mainstream because initially it was sort of elite women on the East Coast. Uh, and um, Willard was the uh, president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, from 1879 until her death in 1898. Now today we think of uh, the Temperance Union. Uh, it, it sounds like, I don't know, we, Carrie Nation, you know, she was this six foot tall woman that had a hatchet and she'd go into saloons and, uh, and destroy them. 
the, the men were just were hard, just like, amazed, <laughs> and, and, and because she wanted to stop men from drinking. And, and by the way, all feminists wanted men not to drink and to stop the saloons because the saloon was considered, considered to be the enemy of the home because of the massive amount of alcoholism. Anyway, it was a mainstream cause, but Willard was the head of it. But under her leadership, the Women's Christian Temperance Union became this powerful, amazing philanthropic association that began to do work to help the disabled, to help orphans, it, 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 to help, it was abolitionist, again, not just temperance. So it was largely a white middle class organization, but unlike other suffrage groups as it became, uh, it attracted great numbers of um, African American women, Native women, immigrant women, according to one study, 30% of its leaders were wives of unskilled workers. So how did she do it? Well, she, at Frances Willard, you had, you had Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony appealing to universal principles and arguing to women to, you know, that the, their right to these enlightenment, enlightenment principles of, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and it often fell on deaf ears. Frances Willard comes along, and she told women, you need the vote to protect your homes. Uh, and she referred to it, to the, she rebranded it as the home protection ballot. And women were, sort of, and men were moved by her argument. And her followers began to bring the suffrage movement, something that um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and especially Susan B. Anthony, used to get very depressed about setbacks. She brought them victories. So many historians agree that the conservative, not, not, it wasn't that the conservative approach, this is not arguing that we all need to be conservatives and that's, no, if they work together. Now, there is a book that I love very much called Two Paths to Women's Equality by a, a Brandeis University scholar, Janet Zollinger Gila. And her thesis is that American women won the suffrage only when the progressive groups uh, led by Stanton and Anthony, only when they formed a coalition with, uh, with moderates, and may, uh, like Frances Willard. She, and she, she says that um, history records defeat in every instance where one branch failed to recognize the valid arguments of the other. When the two branches cooperated, success followed. Now, where are we today? We don't, we don't really have two branches. We have one rather radical branch uh, in, our, in our women's movement. And if you, if you just look recently, uh, it looked as though we might be getting to have, be, start to have the beginning of a, a women's movement with the, the women's march after Mr. Trump's election. And then there were divisions. Well, uh, people didn't want uh, pro-life women there. And at other gatherings, people were unhappy with uh, any Jewish women that would, there was a Jewish woman that wanted to have a, a, I guess an Israeli flag or something and they considered they, that, was, that was ruled out of order. And now there've been since then lots of divisions. And this, this is the opposite of what we should be doing. Instead of making the, the movement more and more selective, make it more and more open. And uh, you don't have to agree on everything but an inclusive Americans movement, uh, it, it could, we could address intractable problems. I mean, think of it, women's economic precariousness, it's a real problem. Workplace harassment, sexual violence. What if we had fresh ideas and not just tired ideology, not just the same propaganda? It could offer power, and, and this is another thing, we could offer power support to grassroots women's groups uh, you know, across the world in places like, you know, Egypt, Cambodia, Somalia, where women are struggling for basic liberties. So in conclusion, I believe that a politically inclusive women's movement built on truth and goodwill towards men would be formidable. Uh, the, there's a 16th century Scottish clergyman, John Knox, who was horrified at the specter a female political power, which he called a monstrous regiment. A monstrous regiment, he dreaded it. Well, so will the male chauvinists and the reactionaries of the world. Should the women's regiment that I have in mind, 
should it start marching in their direction? So let's do it. Thank you.